Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which for the last four months has been in virtual mode. We've been building up an archive of videos and webinars on the sorts of issues that we were doing face-to-face in the real world. And one of the more important is our continuing series on what's going on in Brussels. We called it Brussels for breakfast. I don't know if you're having (laughs) breakfast while you're watching this or perhaps (laughs) having dinner. Never mind. Um, It is the same format as we were using in the real world in that it is anchored by Graham Bishop, the proprietor of grahambishop.com, who has, uh, he defines himself in, on his own website as being renowned for his vision and his courage oh. to, prop- to propose radical ideas. Uh, he has had considerable some influence on the European Commission. He's a leading technical analyst on the economic and structural developments in the financial markets of Europe. I can say no more. This time we have... Uh, eminent support. We have Sir David Liddington, who was uh, MP for Aylesbury for a number of years, uh, stepped down last November. He was Minister for the Cabinet Office, he was Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, he was Minister of State for Europe, which is the most important as far as we're concerned. He was also Leader of the House of Commons, Lord Chancellor, Secretary of State for Justice. He has a PhD from Cambridge, which beats mine, and he won University (laughs) Challenge many years ago. Andrew Wilde, is the director of Smithfield, uh, which is a division of Edelman, leading its financial services team, head of financial services in Europe, and he's also a Cambridge graduate. And Simona Amati, director at CREAB in Brussels, uh, a co-manager of financial services public affairs practice, uh, who spent, before she went to uh, went to the uh, took the, uh, the shilling from Creab, spent four or five years at uh, the ECB and at the Bank of Luxembourg. I'm going to ask each of them first to say what they're up to these days, and then we'll get on to, to, to Graham's agenda, which they have all discussed. David, so David Liddington. What are you okay, I, mean, I suppose, I suppose the, the slightly facetious answer is to say just thanking my lucky stars that I'm not in the cabinet at the moment, um, because I think they face completely unenviable decisions, um, some of which they've got right, some of which they've got wrong, and but all having to be taken on the basis of incomplete evidence, which when even the top scientists in the world uh, have to admit they know, uh, they have great gaps in their knowledge about this disease. Um, the Otherwise, what I'm doing, I have just taken over from Lord Haig, William Haig, as chair of RUSI, which is the Royal United Services Institute, the oldest um, uh, think tank in the world on uh, defence, security and international policy. Uh, And I've joined the board of trustees of the Institute for Government in London that looks at Whitehall and the Centre for European Reform, which uh, my friend Charles Grant runs very skillfully. Um, I am in discussions with, you know, I'm I'm a sort of now freelance self-employed writer, advisor, um, speaker. So I'm sort of in discussions with a number of individual businesses and organisations about that and have been doing bits of freelance work to help, um, you know, finance um, uh, the, the holidays and, 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 and other, <laughs> other aspects of lifestyle that one can still enjoy, even in these constrained circumstances. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe because Rusi I have a great deal of time for, and the IFG, my, my good, great and good friend, Bronwyn Maddox, has done a terrific job there. Yes. Absolutely Thank a terrific you. job. Changed something that was, in, in my opinion, moribund into something that really does change Whitehall. Andrew, Andrew Wilde. Thanks. Um, well, well, my job and the, the job of my, my team uh, is to look after the, the corporate reputation and the, the external profile of uh, financial services companies, and, and we've got a, a roster of asset managers and banks and insurers in, in the UK and, and across Europe. And that means that it's sort of in practice, uh, uh, the, the aim is to, to uh, raise the profile of their views through the media. So I spend a lot of time talking to investors and analysts about uh, how they see the markets going and, and where they see uh, the whole FS industry headed. And, and I think it's fair to say that for a few months, uh, the conversation has not really incorporated Brussels and the EU to, to any great degree because COVID has become, from an investment perspective, kind of all-consuming. Uh, but in recent weeks, that's that's changed again with, uh, with the um, 
the UK choosing not to extend the, the transition period and, and clearly the recent news on the, the EU recovery fund. And that's been a, you know, the consensus among my clients is that that's a game changer as far as, as the investment case for Europe goes. So that's been front and centre. And, and, you know, and conversely, there's a, a, an opinion in, in some quarters that the, the UK um, risks being left behind. And I'm sure, you know, we'll, we'll touch on all of these things um, during the course of the discussion. But that's, that's kind of what I've been up to of late. Simona? So from my perspective, uh, Reese, for your information, I changed uh, my role in CREAP. So now I'm a senior advisor and a chief economist. So what uh, I'm mostly looking at, as you can imagine, is the economic developments in the EU and the Eurozone. And obviously, there is a package and discussion in the EU Council on the Recovery Fund and the new MFF has attracted a lot of my attention. So we have been following it for a number of clients because they're interested of what is happening in the EU in terms of which are the opportunities and where the funds are channeled. And the, even though there has been an agreement in the EU Council, obviously the discussions are not over because now it's all about implementation. And so we are still about uh, to follow the discussion for the next months and even years in terms of all resources. So this was one of the most uh, focused for me in the recent months. And obviously also how the European economy develops and which are the competitiveness in terms of the EU companies globally because to restart the economy, a lot of our clients are looking forward to having more opportunities globally. But Graham, tell us, um, you, you've set your, the agenda out and obviously the European Council meeting and the uh, European Recovery and Reconstruction Fund or Resilience Fund <laughs> is top of the agenda. Yes, yes. yes. I and mean, the, the main news, of course, is that it actually succeeded after what was, I think, the second longest uh, European Council meeting in, in its history. Uh, but they they finally did it, uh, not without some difficulty, of course, and um, some European Parliament, which has to agree. Still subject to parliamentary approval. Absolutely. Um, and they are busy cavilling at some of it at the moment. Some of um, it's smaller than they were asking for. They wanted two, tri two trillion, and it's just 1.7 trillion, and so on. Um, and some of the uh, favourite well, items. Just, just to explain, because you're confounding two things there. Yeah. You're, cons you're yes. confounding the fund and the multi-annual financial framework, yes. right? Yes. Just sort yes. that out for us. Well, it, 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 the, the convenient way is just to put the two together and you finish up with a 1.1 trillion um, MFF and a 750, uh, 0.75 trillion of next generation EU recovery fund. Um, that itself is split down into a whole variety of little bits and pieces. Uh, but from, um, in fact, I could give you some of the numbers on that. Of the 750, um, uh, yes, the 750, the recovery and resilience facility is 672. And then um, of which the loans are 360 billion and the grants 312. Remember, this was the the key thing, how that 750 was split between loans and grants. The Commission wanted it, and uh, the Commission President in particular wanted it to start at 500 grants, uh, 350, uh, 250 of loans. And it's actually finished up at 390 grants and 360, whatever the number is, of, of loans. So the classic fudge uh, spitting the difference, uh, uh, that happened. Um, it's, without going through the, all the details, but some of these things, the um, remember in the past we talked about the Just Transition Fund to compensate uh, countries which were going to lose out on uh, greening. Um, that was going to be a 40 billion fund and is now turned into a 10 billion fund. It's this is the sort of thing which the, the Parliament is upset about and uh, is discussing it at the moment. I'm not quite sure when they vote on it this evening, though, uh, but um, I very much doubt if the Parliament will oppose it in the end. So there's a lot of detail yet to be filled in. Um, I think that there are several points about it which we need to get to grips with. One is the, the sheer political implications. Um, President Macron, for example, told the press conference, this is a summit meeting where I trust the consequences of which will be historic. He added that Franco-German cooperation was crucial in sealing the deal. So there is, at that very top level, there is the perception that this is a historic event. Um, 
It's uh, the Spanish Prime Minister said it was an authentic Marshall Plan, not a Hamiltonian moment, as some have discussed the uh, parallel in the U.S. But uh, we're we're getting there. Um, what I would highlight, actually, is the other thing which I don't think many commentators have picked up at all. Uh, 750 billion is going to be funded by the European Commission in the capital markets over the next few years, maximum five. Um, and by the time that is complete, the European Commission's obligations in the capital markets, direct unconditional obligations of the Commission and therefore the EU, will be 750 billion. Uh, that puts them in the fourth largest uh, sovereign bond issuer in Europe, uh, after Germany, of course. Italy and France, um, only a little bit ahead of Spain, and Spain may catch up if they have a large deficit, but I think you're fairly sure of now seeing uh, something which is, um, what is it, twice the size of the ESM, twice the size of the IB. So when you're talking about um, Europe becoming a player as Europe in the world's bond markets, we have just changed the game. Do you know what what the terms of the uh, of the, the the bond issues will be? Do we know? No, yet. no. the the um, when you say terms, uh, the, the they will ultimately be redeemed by twenty fifty eight. So there's going to, clearly there's going to be a major crunch which runs till twenty fifty eight. But the interim, uh, it's all for discussion. But the central point I want to make though is the the European Union here is the Commission as the ESM. And the EIB um, will be, um, just thinking of that in total, will be two thirds of the size of the US uh, Treasury bond market. So it depends how much you split it into bills and bonds and that sort of thing. But we are, cha- we are seeing uh, in the financial markets, we're about to have a game changer for the standing of the Eurozone in the world's bond markets. Well, let me ask. Let me ask David and Andrew and Simona to to respond to that. Yes. I mean, do you see that as this Hamiltonian moment, David? I I I would not put go as far as that as say it's Hamiltonian, but I don't think we should underestimate what has been agreed. First of all, simply to have got agreement on both the COVID recovery package and the multi-annual financial framework, both of which were very divisive issues for the EU, is a remarkable political achievement. For them, and done, killed, the, killed the two birds at the one summit, I think, was, was a big achievement. Secondly, the principle of common debt issuance mm-hmm. has now been accepted. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, um, this is meant to be a one-off, and it's meant to be time limited. Well, William Pitt said that income tax was temporary when he first introduced it. A really important precedent has been set. And there's also an obligation on each member state to present to the Commission within a very short period of time, a recovery and resilience plan, which the Commission will then assess and and which will then govern uh, the way in which recovery funds allocated to that member state should be spent and monitored. And those um, recovery plans are to be approved and adopted by the council, not the the European council, the the normal council of ministers, by qualified majority vote, not unanimity, no vetoes. Um, So if for the sake of argument, um, the commission puts forward a proposal which actually says with Hungary, well, we'll need some certain measure uh, met on rule of law and uh, political reform, uh, then, and there's a QMV behind that, Urban cannot veto it. Um, same if somebody comes forward with the economic proposal that the, the Commission really doesn't think they, they want in there. If the Commission can get its QMV, then you can put through a, 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 a plan which is not necessarily what the member state ideally would have wanted. Now, in practice, there'll be a lot of discussion behind the scenes to make sure people are spared the embarrassment of the showdown at a council of ministers meeting. But but it's a really important step forward. I think saying it's Merkel. Merkel has spent political capital. She has, she's uh, now going next year. Um, She has always been a convinced European. Her popularity has resurged. 
um, because of how she's managed COVID. And she's used that political capital to trample on um, some German sort of shibboleths that they, 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 they've cherished for years and years about no common debt issuance. And the Franco-German partnership is still effective despite the fact that Merkel and Macron find it really difficult to get on with, with one another. So um, just on what Graham said about the parliament, um, Sassoli, uh, the president of the parliament, has said that he thinks September is going to be the big uh, the, the, the big deal for them. This is a, a, a sort of second reading type debate, I think we'll see this week. Then over the summer, uh, which is another reason why I think, you know, we can't look for a Brexit resolution over the summer. Over the summer, the Commission, the Council Secretariat, the Parliament are going to be sitting down and thrashing out where the compromises are made. So I would expect to see something put back into the MFF for um, uh, the, the, some of the Parliament's most cherished objectives, a bit more on climate, um, more on asylum, probably, which really matters to countries like Greece, Malta and, and Italy. Um, the reason I don't describe it as Hamiltonian is that there's some fundamental problems that have still not been resolved. There are basically two, it seems to me, that have not been resolved. I mean, the first is political, which is that um, if you are Giuseppe Conte, or um, if you are Sanchez in Spain, to keep the populists at bay and to get support from domestic opinion, you need more Europe, you need more mutualization, you need more common funding. If you are Rutter or Stefan Löwen in Sweden or um, Kutz in Austria, you need the reverse to fend off your populists and to maintain domestic support. You don't want any more European intervention or uh, common liabilities or anything that starts looking like a transfer union. So that fundamental political tension is still there and is still unresolved. But secondly, how's it all going to be paid for? You know, the bonds will be issued, um, but uh, what is the resource from which they are going to be paid back when Thierry Breton is saying that uh, you know, they are not going to be any extra taxes levied on EU citizens. Uh, and I can't see that um, holding up. So I think there'll be a very interesting and contentious battle to come over own resources and potential new taxes. And I think they will look to environmental schemes uh, and environmental taxes primarily. But also, FTT is back on there. It's in the German presidency um, priorities document as well. And I think we haven't seen the last of that. Gosh, some things in there. Of course, they could follow the Austrians and issue a 100-year bond and at least push it way into the next century. Andrew? Um, well, I mean, uh, I'll echo a few things that, that Sir David said, but, but I mean, I mean, the first thing is, you know, clearly this is a, a big, big moment. But, you know, Hamiltonian, well, I, mean, I think what we don't know is what the actual investor appetite for, for, for the bonds will be, you know, I, I, it's precipitous to say that this is, you know, the beginning of, you know, of some sort of movement towards shared bond issuance, because we don't know how the investor community is going to digest it yet. And I was talking to a, to a friend of mine at the FT, and, and you know, certainly he was very sceptical. Um, and, you know, so, so I think that's, that's the first thing. And, but I, what I would say um, you know, echoing Sir David is is the, uh, you know, the the idea that this is one and done. I don't think that really washes either, because you know um, QE wasn't wasn't one and done. As the, and what this has done is is smashed the t the taboo yeah, of, exactly. of of collective bond issuance, and that's actually why the markets have responded well to it. You know, it it, it demonstrates fundamentally. That monetary policy isn't the only game in town, and you know that what this portends—the fact they've actually done something rather than kind of discussing uh, ad nauseum—is you know you've suddenly got a very credible and proactive block, which you know which augurs well for further integration kind of down the road. And I think that's the important part of it. What it sort of 
portends structurally rather than the bond issuance itself because we, we won't really know until people start sort of buying. What about, what about the investor appetite, Simona? Are you, um, how do you see this from Brussels? I don't know, from my perspective, I hope you hear me better. Uh, I agree with Graham that um, I think it's a very important deal that was done. And I think one of the most important things is the fact that the European Commission and the Union are tapping the market so heavily. Actually, they're tapping the market uh, more than 750 billion because you also have to count the SURE initiative, which is the unemployment scheme. And the Commission will start tapping the market at end September, beginning of October already with the first tranche. So actually, it's a very large tapping of the market. And I think they will be best prioritized with the AAA of the European Union. The second important point is that different from the global financial crisis, we are not going into even intergovernmental, but uh, we are staying into the EU framework, which is very important. And that's why in the discussion at the European Council, the decision-making process on how to approve the plans was rather controversial, because we are not in the easy game of the intergovernmental, but we have to respect the EU framework. And third, I know that the European Parliament and many others have been contesting the cuts in the MMF, in the EU budget, especially in Horizon, etc. But if we look at the overall target, the Commission now clarified that we have 50% of the funds for traditional policies like cohesion policy and uh, agriculture, and 50% of the funds altogether dedicated to innovative policies like digital policies, etc. So de facto, it is a balance still at the end if you look at the overall envelope. Where we are not good with the agreement is that, first of all, the 750 billion are temporary, like it was said before. But if you look at the tradition of the EU, when you set up something, it becomes a precedent, you might have, if it works well, you might well renew it in future. So we have a chance in the future, if you use it well, this money, to have this facility renewed. Second, I think uh, what is not so good is that it, it's, uh, we need consent by the parliament, especially on the MFF. But because the agreement was so difficult to find, I think there is a limited way to, to change it. So the parliament has a difficult task, and I don't think it will be easy to change the overall numbers. What maybe they can do is to change you know, the different uh, sub-programs and maybe to, to move money from one to the other. And the last point, I think, uh, the own resources. So the, all the discussion and the repayment of the bonds and the time in which you will start repaying the bonds and there is pressure by some member states to start as early as possible is linked to the fact that you need to, to fund this payment. And in order to fund it, you need to have more own resources. And here I think it will be a big battle coming up and it will last for a while. So I say we have three good points and three bad points from the EU Council Agreement. Okay, back back to you, Graham. I mean, uh, this this business of servicing the the bonds is going to be a huge issue, is it not? No. Oh, when did when did the UK last repay the gilt market? Never has done. Never. So got, in other words, this it, this can't be a one off. It has to be a continuing rolling program. Uh, uh, by the time we get to twenty fifty eight, um, it'll, there'll be a refinancing for another twenty or thirty years, and exactly the same way we have done with gilts and US Treasuries since time immemorial or thereabouts. So I, I'm not concerned about that. Also, investor demand, let me just make the point. Um, I have no doubt that investors will go for this big time. Um, a few months ago, I did a project um, which is not yet published for the European Commission on investor demand. And this is precisely what the investors want. A full yield curve, high liquidity, AAA, um, no haircuts, fully eligible for collateral, et cetera, et cetera. They'll go for this big, big, big time. I mean, let me just ask one question on this. I, this is looking at the documentation. It does not say that specifically that this has the full faith. This is not the full faith and credit of every uh, every EU member state. This is raised by the Commission, and the, the the documentation says it is the Commission's responsibility. It is not. It is not. Uh, I, I, I keep forgetting the word. It's not pari passu. Uh, it's not. Um, Whatever it is, what's what's the alternative? You know, it's not everybody's uh, joint and several. Is what you're Sorry, right. it's not joint and several. Yes, it's not joint and several, and it doesn't even say that it is pari passu in the documentation. It simply says it is the Commission's responsibility. But then, who who backs the Commission? And that's where well, you... that, it leaves that up up to up to the reader. 
Well, I think I think you'll if you go into the legalities, the Commission can only borrow on the basis of um, the commitment by the members by the member states, brackets at the time, uh, of um, their full resources. But that is pari passu, or that is joint and several, because it really matters to investors. Doesn't it? Effectively, is joint and several, very close to it. It may not be perfect. It's the same. Um, everyone treats uh, EIB, um, ESM, etc. As full faith and credit, they treat it like that. It isn't actually. It's um, the commitment by the members of the European Union to make good. Um, anyway, so the, the, the question um, about the full faith and credit, uh, the, the the parallel is with the ESM and the EIB, which investors have no qualms about whatsoever, uh, and they are not the full faith and credit of the European Union member states. It, they are a financial institution which is uh, the member states have committed to top up the capital to enable any loans to be repaid. It's not a joint and several. It's a very careful construction to avoid that. It's the same capital key for the uh, ECB as well, the same device, though as the ECB prints its own money, that's not a problem. Investors are likely only to uh, query the, uh, the credit of these new bonds if there was a real black hole in the EU's tax revenues or the EU itself began to break up. Um, but I don't expect either of those. Um, I just want to also finish on this point about the European semester. Um, that already exists and is now, we're, we will be starting the seventh, or is it the eighth round of it? This is post the GFC. Um, so there is a mechanism for the Commission to oversee every aspect, and it is very wide ranging, every aspect of economic policy in a member state, and to produce recommendations which in the past haven't particularly um, been followed by honoured in the breach. But this time, if you want your money, you will follow the recommendations. That's a big change. Okay, do you want to continue with your agenda? Yes, um, just a quick comment we should, for the record, uh, on the, um, the presidency of the Eurogroup. Um, it's not a big deal, but the fact the Irish finance minister won with the support of the EPP, in other words, the centre-right political family, I think that's quite interesting. Um, uh, Nadia Calvino, of course, would have been the first lady, but she was from the socialist side. And yet again, they've lost out when it comes to a power crunch. So I think we can look for um, Donahue, Donahue uh, to be far more, um, I would say right wing, but not pushing the agenda of, uh, sort of trying to mutualize more debts and all the rest of that sort of thing. Um, so there isn't a shift to the left built into this. D David, do you want to come in on that um, as a professional politician? Uh, Pascal Donahue, yeah. clearly well, a different yeah. kettle of fish than Nadia. Different Cogliano. kettle of fish. I mean, I, 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 and I look at this with a sort of more of a political side. I mean, first of all, Pascal... Um, is certainly the finance minister in Europe I'd most like to have lunch with. Um, he's he's always really enjoyable, affable company. Um, <laughs> he's a complete geek for UK politics. He can probably recite the script of every Yes Minister programme in, in all the series. Um, I'm not exaggerating. But he's, he's, he's immensely amiable. And I think you know, when you are trying to get unanimous support. Actually, somebody who the others think, yeah, I can, you know, this is a sensible chap. I enjoy his company. I'll work with him. Does count for something. Secondly, I think the Spanish minister um, came across, as my understanding is, came across as rather dismissive of the small countries and rather took it for granted that if the French, the Germans, the Spanish and the Italians are all signed up for something, yep. that that was it. It was in, in the bag. And at a time when uh, you had a Franco-German initiative on the COVID recovery plan and accumulated resentments uh, against you know, any attempt at a directoire. Um, that was playing with fire, and I think the Irish are able to exploit that. Um, the, um, I'll, first, it, it illustrates again the truth, of, which the economists wrote about the other week, that Ireland is immensely skillful about maximizing its leverage from its membership of international organizations and preeminently the EU. Um, and, and they play the game, they're very collegiate, they go with the flow until it comes to something that they really want or they care about and want to block. And then they go all out for that and everybody by then has accumulated debts to the Irish because they've gone along and supported them. 
on something. And for some key points, Catherine Fall, who preceded um, uh, Zellmeyer as uh, the Director General of the Commission, um, uh, you know, Irish, um, Phil Hogan getting a really important uh, a brief in the, uh, the Commission at the moment. They've got a track record of this, but also they're a friend of cohesion, but they're a net contributor not recipient, so they're not seen as a basket case. They had a rescue programme. They took some of the most painful medicine swallowed anywhere in the EU, and they have turned their economy round. So they were able to appeal to both the uh, the recipients and the contributors as, as, as having shared their experiences to some extent. And of course, they, they're they speak English, but they're not British. Uh, they so, yes. so uh, Graham, back to your agenda. Let's move on. Yes. Let's, uh, well, let's, while we're on that topic, go to Brexit for a moment. Um, and th- th- the big thing, really, is uh, what I found absolutely astonishing was um, Michel Barnier's speech at the Eurofee conference. Um, his up, uh, update on EU-UK financial services relations. The UK is looking to go much further than the EU. I will be blunt. Its proposals are unacceptable. I'm that, uh, David, I'm sure, will say that's pretty plain speaking for diplomatic people. He then went on to point by point um, about uh, we're attempting to frame the EU's process for withdrawing equivalence decisions. Um, they want to limit the, so- the scope of the so called prudential carve out, which is one of the key elements in all these um, foreign trade deals. Uh, there's no way member states for the European and all the European Parliament would accept this. And he goes on. Um, the UK wants almost free reign for service suppliers to fly in, wants to ban residence requirements for senior managers. Um, let's be, let me be clear. The UK chose to be no longer a member state. And what, what he's saying is we are demanding all the rights of being a member state. Um, let us be, have no illusions. The UK will progressively start diverging from the EU framework. At the last uh, session of these, we talked about the Chancellor's measures to do precisely that. So I find that as far as the financial services world is concerned, this is going to be very difficult indeed. And I think. Let, let me ask Simona to come in on that. I imagine that Simona will back you up on it. Simona. Um, so I think. Uh, for financial services, one of the important discussion in uh, in the discussion of the FDA is about what happens with the equivalence decisions. And uh, I have the impression that the Commission and the EU doesn't want to diverge very much from the equivalence framework, so to keep it as unilateral and to keep it as being able to change it uh, when possible. And seeing with concern the fact that the UK has already accepted the fact or said that they want to diverge in certain areas. Uh, I think that the process of equivalence will become forward-looking even more in future. So in a certain sense, imagining how the divergence will continue in future and therefore concluding yes or no, it can be equivalent. Uh, And I think this is one of the main sticking points uh, um, that will be used by the Commission who, in effect, uh, had to conclude certain assessments by a certain time has not done it in order to foster uh, a possible agreement under the FTA as a negotiating chip. Are you? Do you share that? The who's who, what? What's your interpretation of this, Andrew? And then I'll ask David from a political point of view. Um, uh, I mean, for, I think speaking to my my clients, there is. Uh, I mean, interestingly. Uh, well, one of my clients is, is EY, and they've just done a they did did a bit of a flash poll with some some of their clients recently, and 70, 70 something percent of kind of senior people in in financial services think there won't be any kind of special arrangement for the city come come January one. So you know that there, there, there won't there, there'll effectively be no deal terms for for financial services. Which, I mean, you know, on the face of it, it looks a bit like a disaster. Um, and you know, but what I would say is, it's a, it's an incredibly well prepared sector. I mean, I I know this from talking to our own clients that they've, you know, they've been doing they've been been working incredibly hard for you know for for a few years, 
making their contingency plans, opening the offices where, you know, where needed. And whilst I don't think anyone is going into next year thinking, you know, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. And there's a sense of sort of resignation and that, that it, so it, it is what it is, um, to use that cliche. I also think that privately, lots of people think that enhanced equivalence, you know, if we were to get it, is actually uh, is a bit rubbish. I mean, compared, to, you know, and I defer to um, to David here. Um, you know, under Theresa May's proposed deal, uh, they would have got a you know a substantially better outcome potentially than than what is now being couched as a good outcome to what we could get. So I think we've fallen quite a long way. Um, and just finally, to to pick up on your point about uh, Michel Barnier. You know, I think with what's happened with the EU recovery fund, suddenly, you know, the, the bloc is in a position of credibility and strength. And there is certainly a feeling that it, it that there would be a willingness to make an example of the of the UK, because as you pointed out, Graham, you know, we we're the ones that have chosen to be on the outside at this point. Our choice. David. Uh, I agree um, very much with what Andy has just said, both about the the fact that I think what the May deal had was, was offered better. To, it, it wasn't it wasn't the full passport, but it, it was, was. I don't think that was ever available once the decision to leave had been taken. But it was better than what is on on offer being discussed now. And I completely agree with Andy about um, the level of preparedness. In the financial services sector, I think they've they've got their legal entities inside the single market. They've got uh, operations of the whatever size they need. They can scale up, scale down um, uh, both activities and people um, uh, as as they judge it is necessary for their their business. I think I just want to take a step back before coming back to financial services. Actually, the first point to remember when talking about Brexit now is that this is nowhere near the top of the priority list for any other European member state other than Ireland. Um, If you look at the German presidency priorities document, uh, the first mention and only mention of Brexit is on page 21, where it's sandwiched between, there's a paragraph sandwiched between a paragraph on the US and a paragraph on China. Um, so that gives you an idea of how it is seen. They, they've made the mental break. They're fed up with what they see as delay and tergiversation from the UK government. They want to get it done with as little damage to EU interests as possible. And that we've got plenty for us to think about as 27. Thank you very much indeed. That's what we're going to focus on. Tell us when you're ready. Um, the On financial services... <laughs> I do think they they still see a profound interest in EU companies retaining access to London. That will be important to them. So the quid pro quo is the one's got to try and minimise friction uh, both ways. Um, Equivalence is also there in the political declaration, which um, Barnier says repeatedly is the, uh, the template for the positions that he is putting forward. So I tend to the view that while there's no doubt that France, Germany, Ireland, Luxembourg in particular, are all keen to wrest elements of a financial services business away from the UK, and I'm convinced we will see new legislative initiatives in the years to come that will make it more difficult for uh, entities based outside the EU to carry out certain types of business uh, in the single market, that the there is a card being held back here. And I think that um, an equivalence decision, which Jonathan Hill has said repeatedly, has, ve- has always carried very strong political elements, uh, uh, is, is, is there when, if and when, Barnier and the EU think that the UK is making the the moves, accepting the trade-offs, offering the compromises on the things that really matter to them, on level playing field, on fisheries, and on the uh, the, the sort of structure and governance of uh, whatever agreement might be negotiated. So I think one could suddenly find in 
you know, September, October, that, that this comes back very quickly. But it will be still, I think, pretty basic equivalents of that, that at that stage, but possibly leaving the way open to something that you know, looks more like enhanced equivalents once the separation has taken place at the end of the year. I'm fascinated by what all of you seem to be saying, which is that there's, you know, no no deal is likely in the short term, but everybody is prepared for it. So it isn't such a big deal. And that sort of is, uh, is obviously there's a certain tension here. We are prepared for the worst and the worst isn't that terrible. Wait a minute. <clears throat> the, the firms are prepared. The UK is not. The UK is going to lose sizable foreign exchange revenues and tax revenues at a moment when it doesn't particularly want that to happen, for obvious reasons, running a huge current account deficit. But the firms, as always, will be fine. They've taken evasive action. They, they're not worried. The UK should be very worried. The City of London, as it were, should be very worried. Right. OK, continue down your list, because uh, time passes, Graham. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I think the next one I would like to talk about is, uh, I'm going to skip the Commission's forecast. Um, that was just pretty... Those, those of you who, who listen to my economic rap most, week, most Monday mornings will get the European Commission's ah, forecasts. Good, right, excellent. OK, so let's talk about Wirecard. And this is a, an absolutely extraordinary uh, thing. When, going back many years now, we've had a variety of accounting directives and transparency directives and so on, all this um, panoply of regulation at the global level, but at the EU level for sure, uh, international accounting standards to make sure this sort of thing doesn't happen, can't happen. And yet it did happen in, of all places, Germany. And when you, uh, there's a, a terrific um, article by Nicholas Ferron, who we all know and, and love very much. Uh, he's He really just, ridicules the, the structure, uh, as you put it, is um, the Auditors Act under a public mandate enshrined in national legislation, which is only spottily harmonised at the EU level. Germany's audit regulator is the auditor oversight body, a tiny entity uh, in, the, in Congress lodged in the Federal Office of Economic Affairs, has a budget of 5.5 million euros. This is ridiculous. This is tiny. And so one way or another, they got the wool pulled over their eyes. I must say it's 100% full marks and gold stars to the FT for pursuing this for quite a number of years, gradually pointing out that all these accounting um, entities around the world, uh, they and the FT has the capacity to do that analysis. It, it and, just, and the implication for the European Union is what? Uh, that we will have to have another major review of um, the way, not perhaps the, the way in which the accounting directives of been enacted, the way they're operated. In other words, more Europe. There will be a greater centralization. Will it be under ESMA or some other European body? Just the same way that anti-money laundering, the nation states fail. The answer is more Europe. And that will be That's, the same thing. So, Simona, is the answer more Europe? Is that is that how you see this will go? Um, allora, the question of uh, more supervision and successful supervision is always very, very controversial in Europe. If you remember the ESS review, it was not easy at all. And compared to the Commission proposal, the final agreement was rather watered down. So in Europe, the European Parliament is usually the body who pushes more for more Europe in this field. So for example, more direct supervisory framework for financial reporting, for audit or for AML and payments in this area could be requested the parliament but uh, I'm, i doubt that we will jump uh, forward with the com completely you know centralized supervision of capital market or financial reporting only and the other thing which uh, it's difficult to grasp here is that in the wire card scandal is not only about europe you no know, here there were activities that were beyond the european union so Wirecard has activities i think in Dubai and in singapore which were one of the areas in which fraud was done, or part of the fraud. So it is about also how do you control companies which are in Europe and have third countries operations or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I think that I agree with Graham that uh, theoretically we would need more Europe, but uh, to which extent we should jump to it, I think it's not in the short run. But I think in the medium term, we would go gradually towards it. A little sensitive for you, Andrew, perhaps, given your client base, but uh, you have a view on this? Um, well, I mean, my, my main 
observation, to be honest, about, about Wirecard is that, you know, to our earlier conversation about um, kind of London retaining its strength as, as a capital market, to me, I think Wirecard was, was quite a big setback for, you know, Europe establishing capital markets outside of London, because I think the, the, well, you know, one of the biggest culprits in that was Barfin. You know, they did not cover themselves in glory at all. Um, and the, you know, having a very good regulator is is a huge part of having an efficient capital market. And, and one couldn't fathom the FCA having a, a kind of a cozy relationship with a national champion. Um, and I think that, that you know that there are implications of the Wirecard um, scandal a, across Europe, but I think they probably go beyond accountancy and more into the way that we actually structure the markets themselves. David, uh, I, I do. I did note that the UK also was a regulator of, of Wirecard because Wirecard, I think, has a money transfer license in this country. But David, you, do you have any views on this? Um, I, I, I think that this that the Wirecard episode is going to um, get politicians at Westminster as well as around Europe into this. And I, I agree. I think with what Graham suggested about the the direction of the debate at European level. But don't forget that after the collapse of Carillion, there was a lot of attention being paid to allegedly do cosy relationships between auditors and major clients, particularly when a, a particular firm had been in place as auditor for many, many years. Um, and I think some of those questions about rotation uh, will come up again. It wouldn't shock me, for example, to see Keir Starmer's team starting to come up with uh, a critique of the current audit arrangements, perhaps suggesting even breaking up the big four, um, the, the, the would have quite a, a cut through to the, some 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 elements of public opinion. Graham, back to you. Back to your agenda. Yes, uh, and uh, just to say uh, the, the 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 wire card thing goes uh, as Andy was suggesting. Uh, it's not just the collusion between the auditors and the company, but between the regulators. The cosy relationship of Bashin is the most extraordinary thing. Uh, they actually started cracking down on short sellers who had done their homework because the short sellers had got the right end of the stick. Baffin hadn't. So th it's an extraordinary thing. It's not just the, uh, the auditors here. Anyway, yes, back to the agenda. Um, <clears throat> tax and Apple. Um, Apple took a bite, if I may say, out of the commission. Um, I, I looked at that and uh, whether it's a, a bigger deal as, and the numbers are big, of course, and particularly for Ireland, um, but the uh, the second highest court, not the total um, uh, ECJ, said the commission didn't succeed in showing to the requisite legal standard that they'd received illicit economic aid. Um, so there was a procedural problem there rather than a, a legal problem. It may be that they they just they couldn't get into enough detail to prove beyond all reasonable doubt, as it were. Uh, will, it, will it be appealed? And do, is there any chance that uh, on appeal it will work? Um, I, I I wouldn't. Uh, it may or may not do. I, I wouldn't like to pursue that too far. But it's <clears throat> it's not uh, a matter of principles. What was really interesting, or I found very interesting, is that on the same day or the day after, day after, the Commission came out with its uh, fair and simple taxation package of measures. So rather than being daunted and sort of completely thunderstruck by the, the losing the Apple case at this stage, they came forward with. Um, a, a tax package which has 25 initiatives is going to have, um, where have I got some of the things, uh, it, but it's setting a comprehensive EU tax agenda for the years to come. Uh, recycling, FTT, David mentioned, uh, may be included, may at this stage, uh, and various other things, carbon, uh, carbon charges traveling across borders. Um, so the EU is gearing up again, to produce a tax policy which is going to apply across the EU in a way which for many, many years the union has shied away from the tax questions because they're all by unanimity and there's always somebody. Um, of course, we're not there to stick, uh, stick our oar in. Now, but uh, somebody has usually been uh, against uh, unanimity. Um, David, uh, what, your, your view on this? I mean, is it a, a, a defeat for Margareta Vestager or, you know, is, is this just a, a, 
is it, well, it's a defeat. Is it, a, it? Has she lost the battle or lost the war? She certainly lost an important battle, and uh, her standing in the, the the Brussels Shark Tank will have uh, uh, have been diminished. You know that her enemies um, will be 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 busy whispering away at the moment. And, and I'd have thought that she will want to go to appeal if she um, uh, can possibly find plausible legal grounds for so doing. And who knows what the the upper tier of the court would would decide in those circumstances. And I think it's true, as Graham says, the Commission will use this as an opportunity to say, well, this shows we need to move forward on a proper European legal basis with common rules on tax. But I don't think one should underestimate how difficult it would be to secure agreement amongst all member states to that. As Mark Rutter has demonstrated in recent weeks in the UK's absence, other countries that have um, hidden behind our skirts for many, many years. And you know, as one who has been there, you know, been at a council meeting, you know, had rows with the French and the Germans, and you come out and other ministers come to you and say, I, I do so agree with what you said, David. You do understand what I couldn't possibly say anything in public <laughs> in support, don't you? You know, every British minister will sort, sort of have a sense of slight schadenfreude. I think well, it's about time the Dutch and others, you know, took a share of the flat. But you know, the Dutch, in particular, seem willing to do that and to to lead that that, that sort but of. You, you, you've already told us how devious the Irish are, and the Irish on this yes. particular case are on the other side of the issue. Oh, yeah. right? and the Irish, the Irish, the Irish will be tut tutting about you know um, you know to, to, sorry about breach of um, you know EU principles and all that, and they'll weep all the way to the bank. You know, it, it's, um, <laughs> they won't make too much of public song and dance and sort of vic- they won't be singing. About victories, but they will be uh, feeling rather satisfied. I think. And thank you. Yeah, you this. Quick, quick point there: that the, uh, the the next generation fund. How does the seven hundred and fifty billion get repaid, as it were? Um, tax revenues are the thing. Where are you going to get the revenues from? And this this is going down that route of finding new own resources for the... Uh, the well, you've, already, you've already told us they're just going to raise more and more and more debt in the greatest Ponzi scheme that the world has ever known. <laughs> Andy. Right over, as all governments do, always have done. Um, I, 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 I think me on, on, on this one, um, you, you kind of... You, you, Europe has to be a little bit careful sort of what it wishes for in, in the light of, uh, of, of this tax case because... Like very, very crudely, um, from an investment point of view, you know, Europe is about financials and the US is about tech. And tech stocks have been the, you know, the big success story in recent years. And, and the consensus is that you know, the companies that will thrive you know, tomorrow and, and thereafter will be tech companies or at least tech-enabled companies. And until Europe can attract and grow big tech companies, its investment case is always likely to lag behind that of the US. And so I think whilst pursuing the tax case you know, clearly was, was, you know, had to be done, at the same time, it's really important, I think, that, that Europe doesn't send off signals that it's going to have a you know, remorselessly unfriendly approach to, to tech regulation and, and tax, because that looks pretty terrible from a long-term investment perspective. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that Europe should become some sort of tax haven or a doormat for big companies, but it needs to show that it's forward looking and not backward looking. But that brings up, does it not, another piece of legislation that went through over data protection and the inability of European companies to transfer or or US companies based in Europe to transfer data back to cloud operations that are legally and practically outside the European Union. Is that a big issue as well? Um, well, there's a GDPR review, uh, which was done as required after two years. Um, <clears throat> so it wasn't a, a new piece of legislation. Um, and by and large, the... Uh, the enforcement is new, though. The enforcement comes well, in. Enforcement is still um, <clears throat> a work in progress, shall we be polite. Uh, I mean, it's, it's something which is developing. But it's certainly uh, there, and the review went through and didn't come up with any uh, real problems which needed to be fixed by a change of the regulation. Uh, it, it is very much a question of um, enforcement here, enforcement there, which country is not doing it properly, and so on. Uh, but the, the GDPR is now seen as a global standard. 
Um, and this is the economic power of the EU. Okay, we've got very little time left, but I want to ask each of our, our panelists what they are looking for over the next uh, week, six months. I don't know if, if Simona can hear us. We, we have lost video with her. Uh, Simona, what, uh, what are your concerns over the next month? Uh, for the next month? Ah, well, first thing is that uh, I'm a little bit afraid uh, for what is happening by the end of the year. The end of the year, because first of all, we have a possibility to of a no deal with the UK. And second, because the, the measures which were taken by at national level in order to support the economy for COVID are phasing out or are uh, being uh, done until the end of the year. So the question is, are they going to be renewed? Are we facing a cliff effect? So is the market ready to face this cliff effect by the end of the year for this period? Uh, on the positive side, I think I'm looking forward for all the developments of the Capital Market Union, because the Capital Market Union uh, is the framework uh, in which uh, all the money that the EU is giving through the MMF and the next generation EU, all these trillions are channeled through uh, to the capital markets, because uh, the EU wants to crowd its private money in order to help recover the economy. And therefore, we need the capital market function. So the 23rd of September, the Commission will come out with a lot of things, the Capital Market Union Action Plan, all the legislation on, uh, on fintech, the crypto assets, uh, cybersecurity, the, um, the action plan for retail payments, etc. So I think in September, we're looking forward for a big package uh, to stabilize capital markets and also the fintech issue. Andy, what are you looking for? Um, well, well, my wife's a doctor, so um, I suppose I'm looking forward to a vaccine. Um, and uh, you know, she, I, my wife is actually working on on a bit, a bit on the Oxford vaccine that looks very promising. And and I think that that you can you know, buy your yacht on the strength of the promises at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I need mean, you know. The, I think whilst we've been talking very much about sort of uh, you know the EU regulation, I think so much of market you know, the, the, the Strength of the financial markets and the strength of economies is going to depend on, on a sort of a healthcare crisis beyond beyond political control. So you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm just crossing fingers and toes on that front. In terms of um, in terms of things which are maybe within political control but slightly less positive, um, I I do think watching the fintech space in the UK. Is going to be quite interesting over the next, you know, six months and and into 2021 because, you know, whilst we talked about FS companies being very well, well prepared, I do have a sense that fintech might be very much at the sharp end of a bad outcome between the the UK and the EU. You know, this is a sector that's that's historically hired a lot of people from Eastern Europe, and. You know, not not only on on a points based system. You know, that's not going to be particularly conducive to to getting that talent in. But also, then the people that that do come, you know, their access to healthcare suddenly that's less attractive for them. And even on the basis of with with what's happened with the recovery fund, the consensus is the euro is going to strengthen against the pound. So the argument for coming here and sending money back home. Is kind of diminishing rapidly as well. So I do think that you know, innovate finance uh, and and the UK government has got huge hopes for UK fintech. And I do think there are some uh, some some real sort of red flags that that we need to be be aware of. So you just one thing that I wanted to raise with David, and that is, will we get any support from Europe for Hong Kong in our relationship with China? Um, or is that something that we can't can't count on anymore? And looking forward, what are your concerns with it in a Euro, in a EU UK context? I think in the with with, with Hong Kong, um, I it'll vary from one member state to another. But I think that um, already the the German response in particular has been very muted. So I think the chances of there being a very firm collective unanimous eu response is very very slim for that i think it, it it i think what and i think there's a massive job of work for the uk looking ahead beyond the end of this year 
um, in trying to rebuild some cooperative relationships, which are in the strategic interest of the EU27 as well, because you can talk about a global alliance of democracies, it makes no sense to have a Europe-shaped hole in the middle. But unless the Europeans raise their game and start thinking about how we stand with other democracies around the world to resist and contain uh, the China's uh, s selling of their own political model, uh, then we're going to be in very deep trouble, you know, 10 years from now. In terms of what I'm looking out for, uh, look, very short term, it's all going to be about um, MFF and COVID recovery plan, just getting that done. That's the next sort of two months. Brexit, the key moment is October. Scheduled European Council on the 15th or 16th or a special European Council shortly afterwards. You've got to get documents if there's a deal to the... Um, uh, European Parliament for their November plenary, so they can refer it to a committee to have a report back and the final decision on approval taken at the December plenary. You can't leave it later in October uh, for a, a summit. Um, I am more optimistic than most pundits that there will be a thin deal agreed because it's self-evidently in the interests of uh, the Johnson government. Uh, and actually it is in the interest of the 27th that it's done. November will be all about the US presidential election. Um, what the result is, they'll probably still be counting for, for at least days, if not weeks afterwards, and they may be going to court. Um, but the, actually, who is in the White House um, for the next four years will, to a considerable extent, frame the international choices available to the EU and the UK alike. Um, I think the UK in particular, but the whole of Europe, is going to be facing the bill for COVID in terms of unemployment and uh, the, the, the longer term financing of the emergency business and employment support measures that were rightly put in place early this year, have horrific decisions coming up for finance ministers. And my last point, which I do worry about a great deal, is um, whether we will be able to talk about the United Kingdom for much longer. I, I, I think that the union is at greater risk than I have ever known it to be in my lifetime. Um, and while I don't, I'm, I'm a staunch unionist, and I, I, I certainly don't think an, a Scottish separation is inevitable, I think the risk of that is much greater than ever before, and that it's as much down to English indifference to the union as to Scottish nationalism. And what the Johnson government has to do, working with people from other parties, is to articulate a positive case for the benefits of the union, not just to talk about the risks of separation. OK, the last 30 seconds you've got uh, to, 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 to give us what your European, your EU agenda uh, for the next month is, Graham. Um, I obviously, I agree with all that's been said. I'd say Northern Ireland is going to be the first flashpoint on the breakup of the UK. Um, but what we will see over the next few months is that COVID has made the European Capital Market Union happen. And that's, first of all, it is already booming. Um, but, but also, we have a terrible problem for the banking system. They're going to be picking up the NPLs and, and very, very difficult. So uh, with the next generation... Uh, 750 billion of bond issuance in the next while. Uh, that creates a European capital market, um, a genuine one, uh, and that's going to be the big story which unfolds in the next while. Okay, on that happy note, can I thank you all for watching, but can I thank our panellists, Graham Bishop, Andy Wilde, Simona Amati, and of course, Sir David Liddington. Many, many thanks to all of you. <laughs>